Hello everyone, it's great to be here today. So, as you've probably noticed, my name is Leo Veru. Uh, if my name sounds vaguely familiar, it's probably due to one of my client side, my open source tools. Uh, all of them have something in common. They try to use as little of the server as possible. Everything that can be done on the client is done on the client. Uh, that's often referred to as thin at server architecture. So basically the server is used to store uh, files, data, keep both of them safe, and the client is used for pretty much everything else. Doublet is a prime example of this, and it's what, and it's what inspired this presentation. Uh, it's a social web application for testing and sharing snippets of CSS, and it uses way more client and way less server than most people imagine. The, the biggest reason I'm a proponent of this approach is it's basically infinite scalability. Every line of code you write on the, uh, on the server might end up being executed hundreds or even thousands of times if your application becomes successful or even if you're lucky enough to get slash doted. Everything you write on the client always deals with one machine. It might not be the best machine you can imagine. It might be an old computer that's kind of slow, but it's still probably better than a slice of your server. It also helps reduce server costs quite a lot because basically the server is just used to serve files. So uh, server load doesn't increase, which is the prime reason of moving to a dedicated server and then to more servers. Especially for me, since most of them are side projects, my budget for them is quite limited, and I guess that's a problem that many startups face as well. Every time I have this discussion with someone or a group of people, some know-it-all always points out something like, but servers these days are cheap, right? Not really. Bandwidth is cheap. Storage is cheap. CPU cycles are very rarely cheap and database administrators and performance engineers and all these people that help big companies that have tons of servers, these are never cheap. You can't usually afford these on a side project or on a startup. Another added benefit of this approach is that it helps have a much more responsive UI, a much more snappy user experience. Less round trips to the server mean less page reloads and less dreaded loading spinners like the ones I have in the background to give you nightmares. However, thin server architecture uh, wasn't enough. I wanted to get rid of the data component on the server as well and move all the things to the client. Is that even possible? My first naive thought was to use local storage or index DB to store the data on the client, which works well for some applications. For example, in cubicbezier.com, it uses it, it uses local storage to share, uh, store your uh, uh, the, the curves in your library, and you can import and export them as JSON. And if I worked a bit more on that, you could probably download a JSON file, which would be easier. But still, using files for sharing is so 90s. People want to use URLs for sharing, and that doesn't really help. Another thought was using URIs as storage. This is uh, helpful in cases where your data is tiny. For example, in css.coloratum.com, the data is just a CSS color. Or in cubicbezier.com, the data you usually want to share is not your entire library, it's just a, a cubic bezier curve. So you can just use that in the URL. And that kind of doubles as a feature as well, because you can predict what the URL is going to be just by knowing your data. For example, you want to share a color with someone and show them uh, how that color looks on their screen, you can figure out the URL without even using the application. Tweet Plus uh, is, a, is an application for sharing, uh, for posting long tweets. It's kind of like Tweet Longer, um, but it's entirely client side. It has basically no server side component. The, the server is just used for serving files. And th the way it works is by encoding the entire long tweet in the URL, which might sound unwildly and counterintuitive, who wants to deal with huge URLs like this. But it, becomes, it makes more sense if you realize that when you post a URL on Twitter, it wraps it on its own URL shortener. So basically, the entire huge tweet plus URL that might be, that might be up to 2,000 characters just becomes a small 20-character uh, t.co URL, which you can add in every tweet, in any tweet you want. So basically, it's using Twitter to store your long tweet, which creates just a single point of failure. 
if Twitter goes down, you lose your data, but you don't depend on an external service. Like if Twitlonger at some point decides that their business model is not really good and they decide to close down, poof, goes your long tweets. Uh, a thing to keep in mind when using this approach is A, if history API is available, use history API because setting the, the hash uh, might cause page jumps. And also, the most importantly, don't fire it too frequently. Good candidates for this is events like on blur, on unload, on mouse out. Bad candidates for this is events that fire all the time, like on mouse move or on key up or on input. Because that means that if someone uses your application for five minutes, you've completely littered their browser history. Every, uh, th the browser history basically consists now uh, of tons of states, intermediate states in your application that they don't really need to refer to. However, when I created Dablet, it was clear that that approach was not going to be good, neither of these approaches. I couldn't use local storage or index DB and store the snippets on the client because then people wouldn't be able to share them easily. And obviously I can't use huge URLs to, that, that, that contain the entire CSS and HTML code. So I needed to come up with something else. At some point I had a light bulb moment and I decided to use the, guest, uh, the GitHub guest API and I know you're probably thinking, but come on, JSONP is not really the best way to deal with this. So you need to use a server as a proxy, and that kind of defeats the purpose. Actually, these days you can use third-party APIs from the client directly with no server interaction by using a technology called cross-origin resource sharing, or CORS. That's, this basically means that for APIs that allow it, you can use uh, XML HTTP request normally, just like you would otherwise. Uh, you need to work around uh, limitation 98 and 9. Uh, it doesn't support course in the standard form. It supports it in a different object, X domain request. But that's just a small difference. It basically operates in exactly the same way. And course is supported by pretty much every browser. Uh, the main exception is Opera, but it will support it in Opera 12. You can already test it in the nightly builds. The biggest caveat, of course, is that APIs need to allow it explicitly by using an access control allow origin header to define which domains can access it. And some of them are more reluctant uh, than others. Some nice APIs that allow it are these, many Google APIs, GitHub API, which is great, uh, especially for my case. Open exchange rates is an API that allows you to get uh, prices between different currencies. Ziptastic allows you to get city and state information from zip codes. Get fav icon allows you to get the fav icon, many others. The most notable exceptions are Twitter. Come on, I know there are many of you here. <laughs> and Flickr. There's actually a feature request on Twitter for a long time, and they're kind of not saying exactly no, but it's gonna happen at some point. We don't know where that, when that point is going to be. I'm really looking forward to that. And it's actually up to you as well. If you request course support in, from Twitter, they will have to support it eventually if lots of you request it. And I don't think I really need to explain the benefits that Course has over JSONP. It's way more powerful. It basically allows you to do all the range of different HTTP requests. JSONP is just a hack that basically only allows GET requests. With Course, you can do any kind of uh, request, a uh, POST request, a uh, PUT request. Um, you can have all, you can send different HTTP headers, read HTTP headers. Uh, it has much better error handling, basically anything you can do with XML HTTP request. An interesting fact that I discovered uh, when I launched Dublet was that what for me was something that I did to avoid having a server-side component that I had to pay for, people actually loved that. They thought it was a feature. They thought I did it because uh, GitHub integration is something that people would enjoy. It turns out that people uh, trust third-party APIs more than a random newcomer application that needs to build user trust first. Because they know that if at some point I decide to take Dublet down, they won't lose their data. It will still be at GitHub and they trust GitHub way more. Another benefit was that it's very easy to add new features because the backend is already there. 
For example, if I want to add comments, I just need to utilize the API for comments. And even now that, I, that the Doublet interface that is, doesn't support comments yet, people can just go to the GIST and comment there. It gives them a bunch of features that I didn't, that I didn't even have to implement. Like, they want to use uh, a Git repository on it, they can do it, because every GIST is basically a small Git, Git repository. Some of you might think that this is leeching, but actually, that's what APIs are for. I'm not using it in any way that's against the terms or anything. It's good for them, it's good for me. Win-win. So can clients get too fat? Are there cases where you should uh, use your server? For a, a good example of this, and yes, they can get too fat, is mobile. In mobile, the more JavaScript you have, the more you drain the battery. So if your application has lots of mobile users, maybe you should consider doing more stuff on the server if you can afford it. Another case is uh, things, like, things that really need to be centralized. For example, uh, when Twitter launched their new interface, every time you used a different client, you had to mark your direct messages as read again, as read again because they, it seems that the, the red state is stored on the client side. That's not really, that's not good. It, it, it pisses off so many people. So the answer is no. Uh, you shouldn't necessarily client-side all the things. You should examine it on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's about all it. Thank you.